my office looks super messy. I didn't even, well, it is what it is. <laughs> That's why I like your videos because you're just like it is what it is. That's it. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> it's still gonna be fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'll introduce you real quick. Hey sure. guys, welcome to Chef Grace's place. Today I'm interviewing Jessica Savage of Savage Kitchen, and uh, she's she's great cocktail recipes on there. Um, I was actually watching like not even related to each other, but then, you know, they became related to each other. You did the Christmas cocktail challenge. The Christmas oh, yeah. And uh, actually, like next week, I'm going to be interviewing those guys about that. So that was so much fun. They're doing another challenge right now. So I can't wait to hear what they have to say about that. I'm excited about the next challenge, too. I think it's I think it's fun. I love that they're doing that. I think I'm going to try it out. The spicy cocktail. Yeah. Yeah, you should. But I'm not... I don't want to, I have a couple ideas. Number one, I don't want to spend that much money on doing it. <laughs> uh, so, I, like, you know, I love margaritas, but I'm kind of over the spicy margarita fad. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's been done. So, I, th I think I might go with spicy, like, cinnamon, like, Vietnamese Ooh. cinnamon. I uh, see, I like that, because I think people don't think of cinnamon having heat, but it really does. Yeah. Especially the, the Vietnamese cinnamon, it's like, it's like big red chewing gum. It's not like, you know, it's not like mm -hmm. sweet cinnamon, like snickerdoodle, you think it is. Mm -hmm. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. <laughs> we digress. Um, that, that happens a lot. <laughs> uh, so in your, on your channel, you say you're not a bartender. So what do you do? I, yeah, I, I am not a bartender. I, uh, I'm a photographer. I, um, yeah, I've been a photographer. <laughs> when I say I'm a photographer, I, yes, professionally, I'm a photographer. I've been a professional photographer for, we're going on almost two decades now. Um, <laughs> but I actually, um, I own a business where I help uh, companies and brands with all things visual. I'm sort of a freelance creative director uh, for a variety of different companies in all kinds of different industries too. Like there's no particular, like I don't have a niche and uh, work with a bunch of different ideas and genres. So yeah, and none of them are food and beverage related, interestingly enough. That's really interesting. Well, that makes sense because your your videos are like really pretty too. Like your lighting you. is great. Like I'm like, oh, I got to I gotta see what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, what's funny about that too is so, so in my videos, like, it's just me, right? Like this is, this is just something I'm doing on the, on the side as a, a hobby. So I'm not putting into it the normal production values that I would put into work that I produce for clients, which is something that I do and have done for a very long time, but I still, so I go like as bare minimum as possible but like it's still always about like less is more like just read the light correctly and just show people how you would want to see something it's like kind of the best way I can put it so I think that probably comes through when I'm doing my own stuff too and I bet you well I bet you're editing and you notice things no one else notices and you're like oh I can't believe that's there <laughs> yeah for years of making mistakes yes <laughs> I got a lot of those under my belt <laughs> So I also saw you've done some uh, reviews, like people are sending you alcohol. Like how, how can I do No, that? I have a buying problem. <laughs> oh, <Very okay>. different. <laughs> I was like, Mr. Black, I was like, I Oh, I wish they were sending me alcohol if anybody wants to send me alcohol, <laughs> by all means. No. Okay, I was like, man, I, so that all started as, the Mr. Black thing started because uh, the brand, Mr. Black, was hosting this competition. And I can't help myself when it comes to a competition. I was like, ooh, I want to do this. So I immediately went and bought, bought, bought a bottle of Mr. Black and then bought three more because like I just started like going through them and trying out recipes. So I've done that now with Mr. Black, Noble Oak. Um, this is going to be my newest one, Ancho. Riaz, Riaz, have you tried these? No, I've never seen that before. 
So I have had, I've had this ancho, this is for the spicy cocktail challenge, by is the way. Is this a tequila or a... What no, is it's it? a liqueur and it's a liqueur made from poblano chilies. Um, so this is the, their ancho, which they're dried and this gets turned into a liqueur and this is their verde. So before they get dried, when they're still green, they turn these into the green liqueur. So I, um, I've had them in cocktails before. I've never had them on their own. So for actually this week for tasting Tuesday, I'm going to do a little taste test of these, but yeah, none of these, like, I'm not an influencer sponsored by anybody. I just, have a buy yeah <laughs> well, we'll see. I just spend all the money that I would have spent out at bars at total wine every time I go in there they're like you have a five dollar reward I'm like that doesn't make a dent <laughs> so yeah that's that's kind of how the and it's not also it's interesting like I tend to because I work in marketing in a way and I work with brands I tend to find brands that I really appreciate what they're doing as a brand. And that kind of captures my attention, usually visually or as a narrative story wise. And I tend to try things where like, you know, like Terramana Tequila, I just did a review of that because their branding has been so spot on. I was like, I want to try this out. Like, let's see. And I didn't, it was actually great. So yeah. Have, um, that's cool. Because one of the things, too, is like, right now I'm in Florida, but I lived in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. I, and like, I've you know, I've lived pretty much on the East Coast and my brother lives in Nevada now. But when nice. it comes to um, like alcohol specifically, mm -hmm. every state has their own like their own liquor house. control board and stuff like that. Like what's it in Florida? I lived in Florida for a massive part of my life and is it what's the blue law there like you can't buy alcohol before 1 p.m on a sunday like I don't know. i've never used to do that anyway yeah no because we had we had blue laws like that on even on shopping in new jersey like all the malls were closed on sundays mm -hmm. it was like which i'm also originally from new jersey what part of new jersey are you from i am from nutley new jersey north jersey that's so i'm from south jersey right outside of philly that is so funny Okay. What part of Florida are you in? I'm in West Palm Beach right now. I went to high school in West Palm Beach. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. That's so funny. Oh my God. Oh man. Yeah, I don't I feel like I don't really know that much about Florida because I was working as a flight attendant. So I was only home for like a week out of the month before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and now it's just kind of like I mean Florida's a wild west. So like if I had the money to go out I could but I just don't think that's the wisest probably not the wisest choice right now with you <laughs> on that uh when things do open up again though I have tons of recommendations for you if you want I lived in uh I lived uh in Boca and Delray Beach from the time I was eight years old till 33-ish five-ish so okay. yeah yeah my mom's in Boca now so there you go there's some good spots it's like it's come a long way. Like there's, there, there are good spots now. When I was younger, not so much. Now it's pretty good. That's crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> I what, so how did you obtain your bartender skills then? Cause you could have fooled me. If you didn't tell anybody you weren't a bartender, I would be like, oh, she's, she's got the black three quarter length shirt. She's, she's a bartender. <laughs> Bartenders, photographers, there's a lot in common, right? <laughs> um, honestly, there I have I, I genuinely have zero, zero training or skill. The closest I've ever come to working uh in food services when I was a teenager, like a young teenager. My um my stepmother's family owned a marina, and on the marina there was a restaurant, like this floating, it was like on a barge in the middle of the harbor, it's on the Delaware River in New Jersey and there was this great little like diner style restaurant and so I was probably I don't know 14 ish and it was like I'm up there I, I need to work I need a summer job and it's like okay well go go down to the dredge and work go go work in the restaurant so they made me the toast girl I had to like prepare toast for breakfast and I was so bad at it like you would think like who can mess up toast I can like I was the worst and that was like my first and last stop with ever working <laughs> with food and like I'm so ashamed but yeah as far as like cocktails go 
it probably just stems from drinking too much, quite honestly. <laughs> like, I, um, I've always enjoyed, and the irony is like, I make these cocktails and I have to make a couple of versions, right? Like I'll, I'll develop a recipe, I'll test it out. And then I make the version when I'm making the video and then I make a version that I'm photographing. So you think I'd be hammered at the end of this, right? And I tend to, I don't even drink them. I tend to put them in mason jars and I like deliver them to friends. Cause I just like to get like the flavor down. Um, and I really think that it's from years of going to bars and I have a lot of friends similar to me that we used to love pre COVID days, like go to happy hour. And like, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. We have incredible restaurants and bars here. And I just, I think I absorbed honestly from like so many hours of happy hours and like regular places and like knowing the bartender and being friends with them, just probably picked it up by osmosis. But I, I feel like, thank you so much for saying it seems like I'm a bartender because I think it's a really difficult job. And I know that there is so much like skill and education that goes into it. And I genuinely don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I know well, I'm I really doing like that. Uh you know, you're applying yourself. Cause I know like from the time I was in pastry school, I was friends with a couple of restaurant management people. So I kind of got to sit in on like the bartending classes and stuff. Um, and I was really lucky that I worked in the library and right down the hall from the library was the director of all of the, like all the alcohol stuff. So mm -hmm. like he would get like all the wine spectator magazines and like everything delivered to the library. So I'd be like reading them like right before I would you get to school. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I remember thinking like, how could I go be a bartender? Cause I don't know anything about drinks, but then like after I graduated, it just like, I feel like bartending went from this thing where like you had to have skills. You had to memorize like the Mr. Boston book. to mm -hmm. like, if you ask for like a sidecar at like, you know, any bar, they're not going to know what the fuck you're talking about. And they'll be like, you right, like you need to do it exactly. So now we have like craft cocktail bars, but that just used to be called a bar. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm glad, well, I'm glad that at least craft cocktail bars are like, you know, they're coming back. <laughs> well, it's interesting to me too, seeing how like, so my, my go-to drink is an old fashioned. I love an old fashioned. That's like when I'm at a new place somewhere I've never been before and I'm, I'm trying to like size up like I don't know like how do I feel about this bartender how do I feel about their liquor selection like let me order an old-fashioned and see how they do it and the thing I love about that is depending on where you are in the world and who's behind the bar they a lot of them are really different you know like some people add a, a little bit of soda some people want a cherry in it some people you know like it's just so it's interesting to me something that's a simple three ingredient drink can be so wildly different from place to place. I love that. I think that that's super cool. Yeah, that, I had a really good old fashioned in actually in Delray. <laughs> uh, there were, it's not there anymore. I think they moved up to Stewart, but it was called the old arcade bar and just the- Oh yes, I've been there many times. <laughs> oh, it was so the cocktails are just so good. Mm -hmm. like, Cause it was hard also to like come down and find a place where I could like justify spending like ten dollars for a cocktail you know yeah you want it to be good that's the thing like yeah. there's nothing more frustrating than going going out to a bar for example I I have spent a lot of time in Miami Miami is a very expensive city and, and like there is nothing more frustrating than like going to a bar paying twenty five dollars for a cocktail and having it suck like to me that is the most obnoxious waste of money there is. Like if I'm getting a really good craft cocktail, I want to taste the ingredients. I want to know that it was like, there was care going into it. And if I'm ordering a classic, like it better somewhat resemble what I think it's going to be. I mean, our first time at South Beach together, like we went, did the touristy stuff, Noel and I, we went to one place and they gave me the menu and we were looking for some good mojitos and there was on $25 for a mojito with Sprite in it. Oh. Mangoes. No. Mangoes? mangoes. No, that wasn't mangoes. That was the dancing place. Yeah, mangoes. But, but then we yeah, walked that's... down the street and we, I'm looking at, I'm like, I don't want to go in there. I don't, he's like, come on, let's go in a place. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we saw this hotel lobby 
and they had like oranges and limes and lemons like on the bar and that was mm-hmm. like fresh fruit there's a good indication yeah so we went in there and then we we got our mojitos and they were great it was it was like a really old i think it was called the tides hotel and like all these famous people like used on to ocean go there. yeah like mm-hmm. sinatra and stuff they used to go there and it was cool it was like mm-hmm. a cool old old timey hotel but and nobody was in there like everyone if was- you want a good mojito the next time you're in delray beach if it's still there it's been it's been a hot minute uh dada which is on swinton just north of atlantic they have a whole mojito menu and they're excellent they closed down well I just said they closed down no! oh my wow. god i loved dada i we went there once and i was not as the drinks were good but i was not i was very upset with the food <laughs> i was so oh no upset. i uh you know, to pay fifteen dollars for a flatbread that looked like I could have taken it out of the freezer and popped it in the microwave. I was like, get out of here. Get out no. of here. <laughs> there's Although there's one a- of my favorite go ahead. Oh, there was another one we went to called uh, Death or Glory, but I don't know mm-hmm. how yeah. and that that had some good stuff right there. That place is awesome too. That's been a couple of things over the past ten years, but uh in fact, the last time I was in Florida, that's the last place I went to in Florida was Death and Glory, probably sometime last year or a year ago, <laughs> the year that didn't happen, 2020. Um, <laughs> yeah, that place is really good. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this place is good. That's the thing I miss is traveling and 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 going to, my favorite thing to do, like wherever, wherever I go, my favorite thing to do is like, all right, I want to go out to a local spot, good food, good drink, and I want to see like what's here. That's that's my favorite. Speaking of traveling, I saw you stole your jigger from Copenhagen, which is one of my oh. other favorite. Oh, wow, you really world. did watch my videos, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I did not steal that jigger. I bought it. <laughs> oh. and this, from from the bartender directly, who probably thought it was insane. Um, I um, I have a group of three friends that we we travel together. We've been literally all over the world. And we were in Denmark. This was probably four or five years ago now. And I, at the time, I don't think any of us realized the cocktail scene in Copenhagen is out of, it's a scene. Like it's out of control. It's amazing. It's amazing. Oh my God. A revelation. It was just, we spent that entire trip just going from like meal to bar, meal to bar. Like it was, and design too. Like my, these we're all sort of involved in like one's an architect, one works for an architecture for one is an editor for an architecture magazine. So we're all there for like design, right? And we would go to like museum during the day and be checking out these amazing things. It was like, all right, when's our next cocktail? <laughs> like once it was, yeah, that was absolutely incredible. So we were at this bar that we ended up going to a couple of times in the course of our trip because we, the first time we went, we're like, this is just incredible. I wish I could remember the name of it. It was like, it was like a year, it was like 1642 or something. And the bartender is just so like jovial and friendly. And like, we're kind of a, we're a scene when we're all together anyway. So we're all having fun with each other. And we had had just enough to drink. And he's, he's talking to us about the cocktails as he's making them, right? He like, he's explaining his process and he's like coming up with stuff off menu. We're like, make us something with this. He's like, okay. And he would like, just do his thing. At the end of the night, me and my friend Aaron were like, you know what? I want one of those copper jiggers. And we took kroner, the the Danish currency, yeah. and like slammed it down on the bar. How much for the jigger? He was like, here. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> so we each, there, we took three home. He like had a stack of them behind the bar. He was like, go, take, take your jiggers. Yeah, so that's my favorite souvenir from Denmark. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. I have my favorite souvenir that I, I think it's in the dishwasher, but I stole it. I definitely stole it. I didn't pay for it. But it was a, it's a little spoon that looks like a shovel, like a gelato shovel. Ooh. But it's like metal. So, it, you know, like you never find those metal. And I was just like, and I'm like, glad I took it. Because, <laughs> well, you know, like what, a month later, it was like, no more traveling grace so it's like cool oh, every time i use it so. well especially if you were a flight attendant this must be so the not traveling wow like that must be it sucks difficult. it's hard 
because I did, I worked for Norwegian, so we were just constantly, you would fly out and it, uh, like you were, it's international. So you'd fly out of America and then mm -hmm. you'd fly back into America, but it wouldn't be like your base. It would be like LA or San Francisco or, you know, one of their other spots and then back to Europe and Scandinavia and then back to uh, your base usually. Mm -hmm. And then the last couple months we got super, we got lucky, but at the time they decided to close their Thai flight attendant base and just make it seasonal. So they had to put uh, the American people on the Thai routes. So we finally, we got to go to Thailand, which is amazing. Thailand, so, yeah. We, you know, it was, an, it was really frustrating because we would fly to like Stockholm and we were, we'd be like far from the city. We'd be like, you know, right by the airport. And they would keep us there like two or three days because with the legality of like rest and everything they would say mm -hmm. oh you have to rest there before you go back but it's not really true they could have like they could have left us in thailand and had our rest there <laughs> and just like and could have which is definitely it. where you want to rest honestly <laughs> yeah because i like for an american like scandinavia is way too expensive to be there for three days well, in Thailand, yeah. of all the places I've been in the world, Thailand is one of the most affordable, like... Yeah, you live like a king. You get a massage for an hour for $5. Yeah. And yeah. that's what they did. Yeah, that was there there. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like, this is what rich people feel like. You just want to get, like, money and start, like, throwing it. <laughs> yes, I'll take two massages in a row. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's amazing. And, like, the, the drinks there are amazing, too. Oh man, I did a trip. Uh, it's actually my last like huge international trip before COVID was uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. And the drinks, we spent three days on a beach in Thailand. Like, they were glorious. Like, there's no other way to, to describe it. Like, absolutely glorious. Um, but in Singapore, talk about a very expensive city, but talk about craft cocktails. Wow. Craft. And what was really cool about Singapore was going to the Raffles Hotel and having the original Singapore sling. That was very, very cool. Um, and it didn't taste quite like Singapore slings I've had anywhere else. It was definitely a little bit different and I've tried to recreate them since, uh, and mm, eh. <laughs> I feel like you gotta go to Singapore and have a real Singapore sling. I mean, it is different. Like, you know, it's just like the, everything they put in there, it's tastes different, you know? Even with uh, Thailand, like they use all, I haven't been to Singapore yet, but everything they use there is, you know, it's from Thailand. So it's like, it's crazy. Like the, they have this one, um, I don't know if you call it like an herb, probably. Uh, pandan. It's I guess it's like a leaf, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like vanilla, but it, they put it in everything. And I had a cocktail with it in there, and I was like, "This is amazing!" So I brought some like dried pandan home, and it just it's not the same. Nice. Not the same, but it's not the same. That's yeah. Sort of, but I'm also that's actually sort of how. Um... Savage Kitchen got started was over the summer. So we had these these three friends that I travel with um, and had we had all done that Asia trip together. And then, you know, that was in 2019. That was the end of 2019. And then fast forward to this year, COVID hit. And this summer, instead of, we're all busy, we, we work, but it, it, we live in Phoenix, Arizona. So summer hits and you try to get the hell out. Like <laughs> it's hot here and we couldn't this year. So we basically spent the summer around my friend's pool making cocktails. And like, it would be one of those, like, it was like an episode of Chopped. Like, all right, what do we got today? All right, I'm going to try and make something with this, this, and this. <laughs> like, and that was sort of like, it just turned into like every weekend. It was like, all right, what new bottle do we have? What are we going to try? Are we going to recreate a Singapore sling? Which we tried many, many times to recreate, like, and yeah, it, that that literally was the the very start before I filmed anything or started a YouTube channel was uh, getting drunk around the pool. <laughs> Not even getting drunk, but just making cocktails around the pool just because we couldn't go anywhere. So yeah. Yeah. I miss going places. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, well, 
what are you going to use with the the spicy chili liqueur for your challenge? I don't know yet. I've got two ideas. So I want to do one with each of these, right? And with the, I need to taste them first to really decide, but I, um, I had a cocktail with this one with the Ancho Reyes that had a, uh, it was paired with rye and date syrup, mm. which, and it was really, it was sweeter than ant I anticipated. And I have a feeling that this liqueur is going to be sweeter than it seems like it's a chili liqueur, but I bet it has some sweetness to it. So I'm thinking that I think I want to do a bourbon drink with this. Um, I love bourbon. I, that's my, like, if I had to choose bourbon, like if I'm on a stranded island with nothing, I'll take a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> um, so I think I'd like to do a dark liquor. I'm thinking of bourbon with this. Um, I probably want to introduce some sort of fruit to it. Like maybe, maybe coconut. I don't know. So something, but a dark spirit with this. With this one, I'm thinking, I'm thinking a tequila, but not a margarita. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking a Blanco, a Blanco tequila in this, either that or gin. Um, I think this might be fun with gin. That might so, be yeah. I'm, I'm on a little bit of a margarita kick because I, I got those two bottles of Terramana and genuinely do, like, I don't like tequila it's just not my thing like i love I, tequila That's really my, it's my it's my go-to i would say U usually but now uh Noel doesn't like tequila that much so we're, we're you know we can't we have to buy something we'll both drink so i would say the only thing we don't really drink is vodka um but we drink a lot of rum because he's Dominican. so <laughs> mm -hmm. good I, that's something i haven't i have I like rum, but I haven't like done a deep dive into really good rum cocktails yet. And I feel like I did a lot this summer, but like I haven't done any on the channel yet. And yeah. like, that's going to be coming this summer. I think, I think I'm going to do a lot of rum. I was really surprised at how many different, like, you know, like tequila, Mexico, you know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. rum, you have the whole Caribbean has a different rum, like different rum for each one you have the asian rums like thailand and they all have their rums are really different like than yeah. caribbean so i think i didn't expect that at all it's more it's more like whiskey to me you know where you mm. have scotch you have irish whiskey you have bourbon you have all that fun stuff so mm -hmm. but that was fun we went to scotland for my cousin's wedding and we went to a scotch bar <laughs> was that amazing uh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> I remember that we were attempting to talk in Scottish accent to make it progressively worse. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. So yeah, you did have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that uh, their day chili one for a mm -hmm. chili drink will be really cool. From I think so. Action, like. One of my I'm favorite really... tequila drinks is actually, I mean, I don't know if this is the real name for it or it just happens to be the name that the bar that I went to that I drank it, I called it, but it was called the, the El Diablo. And it was tequila, ginger beer, creme de cheese, and lime. And I think if you added some chili to that, it might be like, boom. That sounds, all right. Yeah. It's like always my favorite. Like I'd pick that over a margarita any day. Like, so. Yeah. Especially with the spicy ginger beer, it was like. Mm hmm. I love ginger in general. Like I love ginger flavors in a drink. Yeah, that sounds that sounds really good. I've been playing with chartreuse a little bit. That's another one I have coming up. I was gonna do. I wanted to do a margarita with chartreuse, which might sound absolutely ridiculous because chartreuse is so botanical and like. Have okay, you ever tried chartreuse? I've, I've had it such a long time ago that I'm trying to remember what it tastes like, but I'm, I think I'm just thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm coming up with a way to work chartreuse into a margarita. And I really, I got these eucalyptus bitters over uh, last, I don't know, I got them in like November, December, and I've done a couple of, in fact, I did the Christmas martini with eucalyptus bitters. Um, 
And I really want to use that in more like that. They're just so different and like fresh and bright and like. Well, eucalyptus is my like favorite smell, I think. Like all my shower stuff, like it's all the eucalyptus spearmint from Bed and Body <laughs> stuff. Like whenever they have that sale and everything's like $5, I just buy like everything. Know, <laughs> but it's just, uh, I actually got some of the leaves dried because I saw them in uh, one of the Latin markets over here. And I was just like, oh, I didn't, like, I didn't realize you could eat it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Although you're not supposed to eat it in large quantity. Like you have to be careful with it. Um, I was doing research on this because I was like, I can make my own eucalyptus bitters. Like I got this or I'm going to make, a, my original thought was actually to make a eucalyptus syrup because like, I feel like syrups are easy and you can play with the ratios and dial in your flavor much easier than trying to make bitters, which requires like a lot of chemistry. So with, and doing that, I was like Googling, I'm like, will eucalyptus kill you? And <laughs> no, it won't. But like a lot of it, like a little goes a long way. So I was like, well, let me just buy these eucalyptus bitters then. Um, but you can like, if you get the dried stuff or even if you cut it fresh, like you can find eucalyptus trees around and then just uh, tie it up and dry it and hang it in your shower. It smells so good, it's like a spa. My best friend has a uh, is a florist and has a, a floral shop. So like, in fact, I have a big stack of it sitting on my uh, dining room table right now. Like she had eucalyptus and I was like, can I steal some? I have to photograph a cocktail with eucalyptus. <laughs> it's just, she's like, you're not going to eat this, are you? And I was like, all right, no, I'm not. <laughs> so do you think you might try to make the syrup? Is Would that be less toxic than? I'm going to, I think I'm going to try, I'm going to buy, like you can buy culinary eucalyptus on Amazon. Um, you can buy like the dried leaves. I think I'm going to try that. The other flavor I really want to play with is sage. I was thinking about trying to make some sage bitters. Um, How do you make bitters? A bunch of sage know. in the garden. Hmm? How do you make bitters? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I kind of know. <laughs> it, there's So there's all of these different ingredients that go into bitters. There's like arrowroot and like there's, there's this like recipe for bitters. And like when you see those bottles of like Angostura or Peychaud's, they're all, they're like elixirs for lack of a better term. They, they are alcohol based, but they have all these herbs infused to them. And then they, they're just like highly concentrated doses. And they're supposed to be a, a digestif, digestif, probably butchering the pronunciation of that. Um, and it used to be something that doctors gave as a remedy for stomach ailments. Yeah. So, yeah. So in cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I don't care. Sure. Need a cocktail. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna try. I have to figure out like the right combination of like the other herbs that go into it. Or is it just and like your regular infusion process where you're like soaking it in alcohol over a long period of time, or mm -hmm. and turning it? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Same thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to try it with eucalyptus, but I also. Like, I mean, what are the side effects? <laughs> eh, honestly, I feel like, I know at least I've come to a point this year in 2021, like we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if this is the thing that ends it, all right, fine. I feel like, you know, worst comes to worst, you'll accidentally make like Vicks Vapor Rub and you can just use it. <laughs> there you go. I can think of worse things. <laughs> yeah. So, man, this is a, look at this guy. This guy made me have a sandwich over here. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Are those uh, sun dried tomatoes on there? Yep. All right. No, you can keep them. Keep them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna wait, though. Gotta wait. I'm gonna chew into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I got distracted by this. <laughs> I don't blame you. Hoagies distract me, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. So what is your, I mean, obviously your goal with your channel is probably to get monetized and make money and never have to, you know, have another boss ever again. Or I mean, yeah, that's, that's the dream that and winning the lottery, you know, I've got, I've got a foolproof plan here. Um, but the question is, did you buy your lottery tickets? Cause that shit is up to like, oh yeah. It's like a million. billion dollars between uh, mega millions and Powerball. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so barring that win, <laughs> I'm going to, um, 
I, you know, it's funny. I literally started this channel as a, it, it was, it was COVID related. It was, you know, when COVID hit at first, you know, like everybody, it was, oh my God, what's going to happen next? I immediately lost a couple of clients. Uh, but the bulk of my business was, was fine. Um, but I was like, I'm going to have all this free time on my hands. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. And one of my closest friends who also is in the same line of work that I am, she has a production company in Florida, actually, Plum Productions. Um, and she has a YouTube channel that is very successful. And she had kind of been on me for a long time, well pre-COVID. She's like, gotta start a YouTube channel. Gotta start a YouTube channel. I was like, I don't want to start a YouTube channel. I was like, I don't want to be another photographer with a YouTube channel. Like, no, I want nothing to do with it. Like, there's so many of those people, like, mm, hard pass. And then COVID hit and the boys and I were getting together every weekend and just making cocktails. And she's like, you should do a YouTube channel on cocktails. And I was like, you know what? I've got all this equipment. And I was at this place where I was like, I don't know what's coming next. And I was having, I was going through something personally. And I was like, I need a distraction. So it started honestly, purely as that. And it was a, if I can monetize this someday, okay, great. But I didn't really, I really wasn't sure like there'd be any response so now six months later, like there's like a little, there's this little like dedicated following who always like comments and shares and like asks questions and I'm loving it. And it's really, it's been fun. So I'd like to keep, if I can monetize it, that would be amazing, but I'm really enjoying the community aspect of it too. Like it's been that, and it's fun to not have the, since this isn't, I mean, this is what I do for work, but since I'm just doing this for me to not have the pressure of like having to follow a trend or having to like do all these like proper YouTube techniques to do these things, like I get to really just do it for fun. And I want to keep that, you know, like I don't want to like become a slave to it unless it makes me millions of dollars and I'll slave away. <laughs> I feel like when you, when you become when you get the millions of dollars and you get to set the trends too. So it's like, all right, I'm right. I'm working towards that goal. <laughs> well, and I honestly believe, you know, like being in, being in marketing and like working with people and, and helping them with their brand identity and like kind of getting like their voice out there above the noise. Like, yes, it's important to pay attention to trends, but at the end of the day, if you are producing content that you are passionate about and that you are proud of, who cares what the trend is? Like put yeah. out good work, do the best thing that you can do, be, talk about it to people and like, let it take off from there. That's sort of, so like whatever it is, whether it's cocktails or anything else, like I really think that that's always the way to go. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with working at Sir La Top. I'm teaching the classes. But, oh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, but I'm really just like, you know, by the way, follow me on YouTube. <laughs> absolutely hey listen you gotta hustle like that's you gotta yeah hustle. I think that that's awesome but uh and I think it's helping me figure out what people don't understand about cooking too because oh that's like interesting regular people coming into the class and like I've I've been cooking for so long that like a lot of things that just seem like normal so like mm -hmm. like why wouldn't you do that why wouldn't you put this with that like Oh, because no one ever told you why you do that before. <laughs> right. So, especially like some of the classes are not, the, the classes are only like two, two and a half hours and some of them should not be that way. Like they need to be like, like if you're going to learn how to do croissants, uh -huh. it's very hard to fit all the information about croissants in a two and a half hour class like yeah that seems like it would be intense yeah because you have to learn like what i try i just try to get them across like like across to them like what like the art of like lamination like to have butter dough butter dough like how how it rises like the idea of like why like my thighs butter dough butter dough. yeah i get that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm yeah, working on that yeah. but uh Hopefully not as flaky as a croissant. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been a hard year. <laughs> it's been a hard year. Well, the Arizona sun. But it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong with a croissant that, like, I'm not going to be able to teach you in two and a half hours, you know? So 
but I think um, people are enjoying it and they can, you know, it's, I doubt like any of them will, maybe they'll like if the macaroon class, maybe they'll make a macaroon at home, but I don't think anyone's, everyone's going to be like, oh, wow, that's a lot of work. I'm going to go to a bakery now and buy them for this one. <laughs> You know what's interesting about that is like you have the ability that if you're teaching these in-person classes, right, and you're getting these questions from people, like talk about an amazing test run for how you need to show it in a YouTube video, right? Yeah. Like you're they're basically giving you immediate feedback of like these are the questions that we have. And so then when you're producing the video, you can be like, I need to address XYZ because these were my most common questions in the in-person class. Yeah. Like to me, that's like, talk about a focus group. Like that's perfect. But I'm also finding, speaking of focus groups, that the classes that they're starting to like put onto their like corporate thing, they're kind of copying the trends of the food stuff in YouTube. Interesting. And I'm like, hmm. But they're kind of like a day late and a dollar short at the same time because like they just added like Korean barbecue like they're trying to come up with things that people can make in class and take home mm -hmm. COVID stuff but it makes it difficult because you don't um you can't taste anything in class anymore so you have to wear their mask the whole time oh wow so yeah. when it comes to the baking classes like that's okay because you in general you like go, yeah. you're not the amount of salt you put in is like measured out exactly whereas like in like actually just cooking like sauces like that's all to taste mm -hmm. and you really need to taste <laughs> so it's like you know it's difficult but that's I'm so gonna make it big on youtube so i don't care <laughs> well yes <laughs> keep keep doing it Keep going. I um I can't bake to save my life for that exact reason. How everything it's chemistry, right? Like everything is very precise, measured. If you put like a little too much of this or a little too little of that, it's gonna like make your pastry fail, right? Whereas with cooking outside of pastry or with mixing cocktails, I feel like you have so much more leeway. Like for example, before like I love to cook. That's that is my zen. It's how I relax. I love to feed people. Like that's that like that's what I do for me, right? But then when it came to putting this channel together, I was like, how in the hell am I going to tell people how to make cocktails if I don't have any measurements written down? So it was like the first time in my life I was like, oh, I have to measure things. And so like I, it, that has been actually one of my biggest struggles with putting this together is like before I make a cocktail every time I'm like, God damn it. Like I get that Copenhagen jigger out and I first fill up, figure out where my wash line is going to be. That was another new term to me, figuring out like how much liquid volume goes into a drink and then figuring out ratios, like writing things down from there. And it's like, it's like folding laundry to me. It's like doing a chore. <laughs> like, I'm so used to like just throwing and trying and being, oh, a little of this, little of that. But if you're going to recreate it over and over again, you need the recipe precise yeah exactly yeah that's exactly. been a struggle <laughs> yeah like every like commercial kitchen you go in there's um like a book it's usually like a binder with like plastic sheets so you don't get the recipe dirty <laughs> but uh it's called like the standardized recipe or it's like the core recipe book and it's like everything measured out in like an excel sheet and oh wow it'll be like all right you need a like one of them was like pickled onions. So you need 10 peppercorns. You need one bay leaf. You need this much red, you know, this much red wine vinegar, this much, you know, all this stuff together. And then like the method. And then it would, but that would be like one time. Then they'd have like the two time batch, the three time batch. Like, oh, all wow. Just so, cause you have to be able to like, also you have like a skeleton crew in a kitchen usually, you know, like, if you call out, there's generally like no one to replace you <laughs> type thing. Like, oh, wow. you know, it's the guy's day off who you're replacing. So it's just like a lot of times if someone calls out, someone gets pulled off another station to like try to like fill in or the dishwasher comes up and tries to do some garbage, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. all these recipes need to be so standardized that anyone can go and read the book and be able to do it. Wow. So it's got to be super efficient. 
See, this is this is a whole new world to me. That's why I'm just in my little kitchen with a camera set up. <laughs> like, and that's it. And it's funny too, because I've wanted to, I named it Savage Kitchen instead of something having to do with cocktails because I cook a lot more than I drink, you know. Yeah, like, but that's also because it's an awesome last name because it's sad like it's spelled different. Oh, like yeah. Savage, <laughs> but it's like I'm a savage. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. I came before the song. <laughs> and it's it seems like such a cop out, right? Like, oh, you named your business after your last name. Well, it's a badass last name, all right? Like, yeah. but like I didn't want to name it like Savage Cocktails or like because I wanted the freedom to be able to cook also. Like one of the uh, videos I did was on bacon jam because that's something that I make every year. Um, and then I did a garnish video. I'm about to do another one because um, I would love to be able to, to cook too. Like nothing crazy, but just like small things. But what's interesting is the production on cooking is so much different than the production, like the camera work uh, on cocktails because I'm at a counter for cocktails. Once you start involving an oven and another camera setup, ugh, that is such a, like, that makes me twitch. Cause I'm like, I don't have a crew. It's just me, you know, like I don't have like an assistant here doing this thing where if I'm going to do two setups of a multi-camera shoot, oh, it makes, it get, yeah, it makes my eye twitch. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing I kind of want, like, I want to save up and invest in another camera because it's so difficult to start cooking something and then be like, like, you know, far away or whatever, and then decide, oh man, I need to get a close up of what my hands are doing because right. it's not going to make sense. It's not going to be a good video. And then yeah. you're like, well, I really want to zoom out for this part when I'm talking because it'll look better, but I'm just too tired and lazy to set the camera back up that way just to come back here. So you're just going to be looking at my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Multi, multi-camera shoot is the only way to, to really do it, especially with like, so one of my, my, again, my best friend, that's a florist we did when COVID started, um, her shop had to shut down. And one of the things that she does in her flower shop is she does kind of like how Sir Latob does cooking classes. She does workshops for uh, flower arranging and like building terrariums and wreath building and et cetera. So COVID hit, we shut down and it was like, okay, like, how do we make the money still? <laughs> what are we going to keep doing? So she decided to do, um, she decided to take them online. So we filmed, we filmed workshops where, and it's just like cooking where it's, you know, it's how to build this terrarium. But in doing that, it's so funny. We did that before I started Savage Kitchen. And in doing that, it's like, okay, I'm going to film this like a cooking show. We're going to do an overhead camera. We're going to do a front camera. We're going to do a side angle and like start everything at one time, start your audio. And then you're you're editing as if you were live switching, you know, so you, you start everything, sync them all up and then cut between. So that way you're going through the process once instead of three times. And you're, you're not changing. You're not like moving cameras around because you're all in one location. Yeah. Part of a couple of my earlier videos, you can tell that I had to like how to cut an onion. I had to do that two separate times. Mm -hmm. because I needed the overhead shot and I needed the shot like this, but I was right. just, ugh. <laughs> terrariums, <laughs> that's the enclosed ecosystem thing, right? Yeah, or it's any, I don't, well, I don't have one right here. Also, I kill everything. I have the black thumb, but it's either in a, in a dome of some sort, or even it can be a, like an open terrarium just comes up on the sides a little bit. And there's usually like succulents and gravel and like she has one that has like a little buddha in it and it's very zen it's like a zen garden with sand and like i've been super fun. gardening since the pandemic started i was before this i was actually like outside with my hanging out with my seeds that i just started but, uh, <laughs> i was trying to figure out like how am i gonna move my plants around to like accommodate the new seeds and like what what i have to take out and stuff like that because it's even though like I'm like it grew so tall and big and I love it like it's kind of like diseased and if I don't take it out it might affect something else or you know what I mean it's its own little ecosystem but uh when I started I was just looking into everything I started I tried to do hydroponics this was oh yeah it was a bad idea I tried to do a hydroponics in the summer <laughs> in Florida with tomatoes. Oh, nothing's but a good idea in Florida in the summer 
I, I literally boiled the roots. And oh, wow. The roots. So <laughs> now I'm in dirt. But, um, one of the things I wanted to do, which I'm glad I didn't do because I would have boiled the fish, was aquaponics. Where oh. I, boiled I, the I, fish. <laughs> <laughs> not good <laughs> but does your friend do any like videos and stuff on that kind of stuff or just like the rain well stuff? she's going to be she actually uh she's going to be starting i think a uh like a, a flower fact series and like plant facts mm -hmm. uh yeah flower bar azflowerbar.com is her website i'll, I'll send you a link <laughs> you cool. can check it out <laughs> cool and you did all the photography for that site or yeah so we can we can plug your website too. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's so funny too because like this. A, a, I was super excited that you reached out. I was like, oh my god, that's so so nice. Like, and for and so, like Savage Kitchen is so new and like and like I said, like I started this to as like a coping mechanism, basically, you know, for for 2020. And so like the fact now that people are like watching it and having fun with it, like it's so nice, but it's so different from what I do in the rest of my life that I'm a little bit like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm enjoying it though. Yeah, that's gonna, gotta be weird because with my first impression of you, you're not a photographer. You're like a cock, you're a mixologist. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, that's gonna be interesting. I, that was weird too. And I kind of transitioned from being like a chef full time to being a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. it was weird but it was also weird because like I actually had to like talk to people and that was kind of that was a skill I had to learn oh I bet that's and that's a different like that's just like a different way of interacting with people yeah and like you can't curse at them like in the kitchen you can <laughs> curse anyone out it doesn't matter <laughs> like, yeah it matters on a plane <laughs> matters on a plane <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny we just, we just have to try to stay like this. <laughs> like the whole time. Wow. Yeah. Maybe. But I feel like, do you find this like, so you, you've had a big career shift in your life. I've, I've had a couple in my life. I've always been, except for one blip, I've always been in, involved in the arts in some way, shape or form. Right. But I, I definitely feel like everything I have done in my life contributes to the next thing, you know, like, I definitely like, so like my, I went to school for film production and communications and I ended up working in television production out of college and like that led to something else. And then that led to photography and then photography led to documentary production and like all of these things, like they all lead, they all kind of like build. And then it's funny, I was thinking about this with cocktails. I was like, well, how do cocktails fit in? And honestly, like every experience I've had in my life, like I've been fortunate enough to travel a lot because of my work. I mean, literally all over the world. And in each of those places, like, like I said to you earlier, my favorite thing to do was to go, like, I want to go eat what the locals are eating. I want to go see what they're like, do they have a cocktail scene? What are their bars like? And not because I'm so interested. I mean, I am interested in going and have a, having a cocktail, but there's something really cool about the ritual of going to a bar and seeing how people congregate in that like locale, like I love that. And so I feel like all of those experiences in my, in my travels as a photographer have kind of like led to like what I'm doing in my kitchen now. Oh yeah. I feel like, I mean, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Mark Twain saying, I never let schooling interfere with my education. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I feel like like even when I became a flight attendant, I felt like I was uniquely um, like qualified for the job because by that time, not only did I have like a ton of hospitality experience, um, and I mean, I def definitely had to come out of my shell and like talk more. Like I was more, I was definitely a lot more shy, but I had started teaching pastry before that. So I think that helped me out a lot, but also, um, I, growing up, I was, me and my brother were, were um, like very high ranked uh, grapplers for jujitsu. Like we were oh. really 
he is opening a school now in Nevada. He's starting out in his garage, actually. <laughs> Rebel wow. Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was like the first and second, like I would go back and forth, like ranked like female grappler for all of high school. So that has always been like, a, it really taught me how to like, fail and like pick myself up because mm -hmm. in jujitsu like you can't you can't lie about your failures you you just get yeah you need up. to embrace them yeah because you're just going to get beat up over and over again if you keep doing the right. same thing so right. um but also then when i came to be a flight attendant i was one of the things we also had to learn was de-escalation because when you actually have been oh. in a fight you learn that that's the last place you want to be right so my communication skills in a sense of like calming everybody down <laughs> yeah it really it taught me like oh, okay I could do this job like you know I can calm people down and if I have to use force like number one I'll probably be all right because they're not going to expect a tiny little girl to do anything <laughs> But I got like, you know, I got a couple seconds before that goes away. But also um, one of the biggest things was that it didn't matter how angry you were. One of the, like the first things I would do is like give some somebody some food, like some chips. Like, do you oh. need some water? How are you, how are you feeling? You know, like, and that interesting was, because when you start eating with someone, it calms them down. It's very Italian grandmother, like, oh, do you exactly. need to, right? Like that's, that's why Nan's always pushing food. Are you hungry? No, let me make you something. Like you that's, something. Calm, calm down, tell me about right. <laughs> And like, there's wow. so many situations on the plane where like, if it wasn't like flight, flight attendants don't get enough credit because there's so many situations where, especially for some reason going into Stockholm, like broken hearted men love to like, claim that they're going to kill themselves on the flight. I don't know. What? I don't know. Wait, 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 wait. Is that a thing? Does that like... It's, it's happened to me specifically like to Stockholm from anywhere. Like I've had, you know, your blonde hair, blue eyed men like crying that they were going to kill themselves over some girl. Like it was just, just one of the, oh, we got another oh, one. <laughs> like after the third one, I was like, and this is, I've only, you know, I was only a flight attendant for five years. So to have three of those was this like. seems like a really high, no, yeah, like that's a high number. Me. I mean, I know it gets like dark and gloomy there for like half the year. So like people are more depressed, but it was always going to that Stockholm, never coming from Stockholm. <laughs> this makes no sense to me. It was just such like... a strange thing. Like the, those are the, fl I had, I also had like another crazy guy who like, um, he was a crazy man. He was like a, he must've been like, like mentally unstable, like okay. maybe like a schizophrenic or something. Okay. And um, he's, he thought Trump was in LA to see him and that he had to get like Turkey and like, the, like, he, you know, he had like this whole thought he was sure. a kind of thing. And I wound up like talking to him for like 10 hours to like keep him calm. <laughs> Oh my God, what kind of punishment? <laughs> finally, finally fell asleep. And, uh, you know, then we got the police to like escort him off the plane. Hours. You've got good karma coming to you. 10 hours. That's... He was like, well, because he was also, he had told me within the conversation that his connecting flight from Stockholm was to Turkey. And then I was like, this could be a problem. Oh, yeah. So, but you know the news was silent that day so they took care of it <laughs> everything's okay everything's oh, okay no, but uh wow. yeah so you just have to like because that could have gone the other way you know you yeah. could have said like you could have lost his mind yeah he could have lost his mind like you could have i mean i'm sure we would have been fine but you might have to like divert the flight or something and you can't do that over the atlantic ocean really so <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah you don't get enough credit but you know definitely not wow are you an anxious to get flying again is that do you, are you gonna get flying again eventually i don't know um i don't think no i don't like i would love to have my job back but it's not looking great you know yeah. Norwegian is a 
struggling. They they declared bankruptcy in Ireland. They oh, no. I think they're starting to get some of the planes repoed. Um, like the leasers or whatever. So I'm not. I think they might survive as like a short haul type thing within Scandinavia. But none of this transatlantic. Yeah. So yeah. I would, you know, I would love for them to come back, but I don't think so. And I just don't think, uh, you know, the American legacy carriers, like, I don't think they're going to be doing much better. You know, they're going to have the support of the government behind them because Norwegian, like the government, Norway's like, ah, we can't really do that much more money for you guys, you know? Right. Um, but for like American and Delta United, I'm sure you know, they'll get some help, but then you have to think too, like everyone who's already hired there, a lot of them got laid off already. And then when it comes first to in line for, yeah, yeah. So the unions, they're first in line for reemployment. So I don't know. I think I just make it big on YouTube and then travel wherever I need to go. Cause I'm going to, I like you know. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this is an excellent plan. <laughs> That's my plan. So <laughs> <laughs> and see all of your these uh de-escalations and talking to people talk about another building block for talking to people on youtube and doing interviews see it all adds up yeah and i think it's from i would much rather like do interviews in person sure um but you know i think it's it's going pretty good with the zoom ones it's not I, like originally I you know my friends were like oh let's do a YouTube channel before we you know COVID hit um so it was going to be more like travel and like cooking like try to cook something that I had overseas type thing or so like the closest thing to what the original intent was is probably the ahi de gallina uh, video which is a Peruvian dish that my friend Oscar taught me how to make and he's in the video so we did like we did the cooking part together and then there's a little bit of us like eating it but like mm -hmm. you know he did not expect like how long it would take to do the whole shooting and by yeah. the end he was like he's like i'm starving <laughs> <laughs> you're like but wait we need one more cutaway <laughs> yeah yeah uh -huh. <laughs> like, i'm starving oh my god he's like remember Remind me to eat before I come over here, you know, like so funny. I don't think people understand how how long it takes and how much work goes into like one video for YouTube, right? Like something like this, like you and I having a conversation, super easy. Zoom, hit record, oh, yeah. and like you can throw it up, right? Yeah. But something when I'm like gonna like mix a cocktail or you're gonna cook something on a stove there's the actual act of doing it, which is gonna take three times as long as it normally does. Plus the setting up the camera, setting up the audio, if you're lighting, like all of those things, like it takes, like it'll take me. And like, I'm a professional who's been doing this my entire career, right? It'll take me for a five minute video, at least an hour of production time. And then editing is a whole other story. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't even, I basically like tomorrow, it's going to take all day. I want to try to do a chocolate mousse video. Ooh. I think Valentine's Day is coming up and mm -hmm. I the thing that people don't realize about chocolate mousse is it freezes really well so it's oh, I did not know that it's a really good thing to do in advance like as long as you have space in your freezer which I'm okay like. but and then I want to add one of the girls at Sir the Top she um she was helping me out in one of the classes and I had made a pistachio buttercream um mm -hmm. And she, but she was like, really good. yeah it is really good but she was like she loves peanut butter for some reason so she was like could you make a peanut butter buttercream and I was like sure but then I got home and I was like what is she gonna put this on I think you just eat that with a spoon <laughs> yeah so that's why I'm like well maybe I could do the peanut butter like on the chocolate mousse and then I asked her the other day hey have you ever had peanut butter and oreos and she was like, no. And I was like, I'm going to change your life for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. Like, have you ever had peanut butter and Oreos? No. It's, it's, I, I didn't know that was a thing. It is top 10, com like, combinations of, like, 
the universe. I don't know. What's it, what's it going? Like? All right. Okay. I'll you don't to... need to get fancy with it. You just need to get some peanut butter and, and scoop it out with the Oreo. Like. Okay. Will it work with almond butter? I, I don't do peanut butter. Can I do almond butter with it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. I don't All right. with almond butter, but it's probably just as good. I'm, I'm all in for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, it's probably just as good. I don't know. I mean, I'd love to do peanut butter. Just, I mean, allergies. That's I'm allergic <laughs> so. to peanuts. But you're not allergic to almonds yet. That's good. No. And my peanut allergy isn't like, I no like EpiPen to the heart. It's just like, my doctor was like, you're allergic to peanuts. And I was like, really? So, but what's funny is when I, this was, oh my God, like a decade ago, I found like, you know, I had a bunch of like allergy testing done and I was never a big peanut butter fan to begin with, except for Reese's cups. I love Reese's cups. They're yes. glorious. They're the best thing ever. Like, and so every now and then I'm like, fuck it, I'm having a Reese's cup. <laughs> like nothing happens. It's fine. But I do tend to stay away from, like, I just, I buy almond butter instead and it's not, I don't know. It's okay. I have a terrible shellfish allergy that I got when I was 12 and I had crab legs were like my favorite when I was a kid. Oh, They were like my favorite. So, but there was a period where uh, my dad was, used to be, or he was a pilot before he died and he um, was a private pilot. So he would come home with all of the leftover food from the plane. So since it's like rich people, it was... <laughs> Best, yeah it was like the best crab legs the best lobster you know what I mean <laughs> so like he would um get like a bunch of newspapers and like wrap up the the backyard like table mm -hmm. and like get the mallets and melt the butter and have the lemon and we would crack open all the crab legs and stuff and sounds like, amazing it was amazing but then um like after he died like my mom, like we didn't, my mom didn't really cook and she, so she doesn't really know how to cook that, so to speak. Like it wasn't like one of the things she was going to do. And sure. then except for um, when it came to Thanksgiving, she loved to have shrimp cocktail because was, she was like, I'm so fancy. Like we have shrimp cocktail. <laughs> shrimp cocktail. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we had the shrimp cocktail and I was sitting at the table and I'm eating it. I'm like, mom, why is it so hot in here? <laughs> oh no. So you like had a reaction? Oh my God. Yeah. And she's like, and she's a nurse practitioner. So I was, I'm lucky that, you know, she's got all the ex expertise and stuff. And she happens to be like deathly allergic to bees. So she we had an epi she in the house just in case, but she was able to um, kind of just like load me up with Benadryl and uh, for that one. And I was okay. But then... It, then I was only allergic to the crustacean family for a while mm -hmm. and I would still eat like clam chowder all the time and then one time in college I had a beer steam muscle and like 20 minutes later I started going into anaphylactic shock and someone had to stand me with the heavy pen oh my god <laughs> that's my terrible friend, yeah my friend had to like my friend lived in Verona New Jersey and mm -hmm. so she was going home for the weekend so instead of like driving me to the hospital like she just like drove me up home so my mom could just like keep an eye on me because she's like oh well God. usually you go to the hospital because they don't want you to have a heart attack but like you're young and you're not like you don't have high you're like you should be fine <laughs> we'll see smack we'll a band-aid on it it'll be fine <laughs> yeah you'll be fine we'll see how it goes but uh <laughs> but like every seven years they say your allergies change or, or 10 oh. years so maybe it's 10. Seven is your taste buds. 10 is your, your allergies. So I'm just. Oh, that's interesting about your taste buds. I didn't realize every seven years your taste buds change. Yeah, because it's, um, that's how long it takes for like all of them to die and get replaced. Interesting. And okay. And you, like, as you eat things and you figure out like, oh, that won't kill me. They taste better to you. Huh. That's so, interesting. That makes sense. Like, why like. Like when I was a kid, I hated mushrooms and blue cheese. And now I love mushrooms and blue cheese. Mm -hmm. I ate it enough where I was a kid where it was gross, but it didn't kill me. So my body was like, oh, that's not going to kill you. You're allowed to eat that now. <laughs> You're allowed to enjoy yourself now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But 
but it is really interesting, but I still haven't, haven't beaten that allergy one day when I become rich and I can get the, they do this thing where they can like desensitize you to allergies. Oh, they give you like little doses of something until you're, until you can eat like a full peanut. <laughs> I can live inside of a peanut shell and eat my way out. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. So one day. Someday. But someday. You have to go back like every, like very consistently. That's another problem with that. But it's out there if you got the money for it. Fine. <laughs> Anything is possible. <laughs> Anything is possible. Well, it was hard when they first started doing it. They couldn't do it for... Uh, like they could do it for bee stings that would, I think that might have been the first one um, mm. but they couldn't do it for things like you ingested you know what I'm saying yeah well and some people have those allergies that are so deadly that like for example like the the plane won't serve peanuts because somebody is like deathly allergic to me like they can't have like exposure to it like I mean honestly if you're that deathly allergic to peanuts you wouldn't be able to get on a commercial flight because they don't clean those planes that well. <laughs> like, right. not, like, that's not, like those are people are dramatic. Like the people that are really allergic to peanuts like that, they don't, they don't even try it. And they actually book like charter flights, like private wow. flights because they're that allergic if they got, or they drive. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they drive. drive or they drive they get the i'm going i'm going to book a room on the qe2 to get to europe <laughs> yeah. exactly exactly right um, it's yeah because there's just no way you know you'd have to be bubble boy and all the the air is all you know filtrated through the same thing so i mean you'd want to sit in the front i guess but Man, I, that would be a terrible way to go through life being that, I mean, knock on wood, that, that allergies like that. Yeah. No, thank you. They're not fun. But also the, yeah, even on the plane, like with the, all these uh, emotional support animals, there's so many more people that are allergic to dogs and need emotional support animals. And I always feel so bad for them because they won't even know there's a dog on a plane. They'll just know that they're sneezing and itchy. Yeah, <laughs> or watering. Yeah. <laughs> And they're like, oh, I don't know. Oh, this is the worst. <laughs> so. so you do all business photography. Oh, I'm sorry, I would digress again. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, this year, I haven't had the camera in my hands very much, you know, because of COVID, most of my work has been remote. So it's funny since my business had shifted from, um, shooting as much as consulting on, you know, design and branding and strategy. This year has been a lot of that for people, which has been nice, but I definitely, I, I miss my cameras. So, you know, it's fun. It's fun having them out for Savage Kitchen. And I also go out, I get like, I get real antsy and like, I literally like go wander into the desert and shoot at night. And I do a bunch of like astrophotography. So that's, that's been fun this year too. I had it, like I do that just for fun and it's something I've always done. Like, honestly, my photography career started from doing exactly that back in like the early, early, early 2000s. Um, I just, I was going through a really difficult time and I would take my camera out and shoot. And then people started asking me to shoot them, like do portraits. And I was like, okay. And then it just turned into like, a business eventually. And so now this year, since my, my business has been so like behind the computer, I, um, yeah, I take the cameras out and like literally get in the car. I like, I, I do this whole strategy. Like I go on Google earth and get on maps. I'm like, okay, the moon's going to be rising like right here at this time behind this mountain. And I'll go like get as far away from city lights as I can get. Usually sometimes I'm looking for city lights. Did and, you get any of like cool pictures of uh, when like Jupiter and Saturn were like? Yep, the grand yeah. conjunction. Yep, conjunction. That's the word. Yeah, that was just a couple weeks ago, actually, and that was I didn't have to drive too far out of town for that one. I just drove to like the the west edge of Phoenix, which is basically L.A., um, and uh, I shot that. But with what was cool about that. I mean, as, as an event, you're looking at like dots, right? Like you're looking at these two little dots, 
which I think is, I'm like a total nerd. Like I love that stuff. I think it's super, super cool. But what I enjoyed about that as a photographer was like the way, the way they were setting on the horizon and there's like a ridge of mountains in the distance and like the color graduations, like the camera picks up so much light that even your eye doesn't see. And so like, I enjoyed shooting that for, for that reason. And like Neo Wise, the Comet Neo Wise last year, when that was in the sky, that was, that's actually one of the things that I keep looking over here because I have like cameras next to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, that's the thing that actually got me out into the desert shooting again. We, we were having this event, right? This comet was visible to the naked eye, which is incredibly rare and had this extraordinary tail. So I was like, oh, I'm going to get out there and shoot. Like, why not? Like it's COVID we're in, that was like in the, the beginning of it, right? Like we're in the midst of lockdown and yeah, I would either get up incredibly early or stay out late depending on where it was going to be visible in the sky and made a lot of really stupid decisions by myself. Like take the, take me and sometimes my dog out into these like roads in the middle of absolutely nowhere with no cell service. Yeah. Terrible choices, but the images are beautiful. <laughs> I'm really happy with them. So, so yeah, if you actually, if you go, it's different than Savage Kitchen. I have, obviously I have a, a completely separate life from Savage Kitchen. My regular Instagram has a lot of those photos. Oh, we'll be sure to link them all because those sound really cool. <laughs> you risked your life for them, so we gotta we gotta make sure everyone can see them. <laughs> yeah, that, I didn't even know astrophotography was like a genre. Like that's oh, it's a whole yeah, it's a whole thing. And like there are very serious astrophotographers. Like I not that I'm not a serious astrophotographer, but there are photographers that buy like tracking devices that move with the earth's rotation and like do this whole thing, oh, right? <laughs> Which it, I, it's super cool. But like the thing okay. I enjoy about photography is capturing a moment. Like I really, that's why like my photography, even when I was doing portraiture, like actually don't like portraiture at all. I very much do like documentary photography. And even to me, astrophotography is that it's documenting this moment. Like, so that grand conjunction, it's like, that moment that's not going to happen for 1200 years you know yeah. like, so that's i yeah i love that i think it's super cool yeah that moment was, i just thought it was so funny too how they like it's always the end of the world when something like that happens you know like the... yeah. <laughs> at this point like come on already <laughs> yeah. keep waiting <laughs> like... i know like uh when, but when they said that i was like well <laughs> If it, if it was going to happen, now might be the time. <laughs> seems seems possible. But I feel like it was that way too. Like Y2K, the year 2000, everybody was like, oh my God, the computers are going to rise up and revolt because the clocks yeah. don't reset. Like, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> like, yeah, like that's, that one I didn't get. I mean, I was younger, but I was just like, well, why wouldn't you just reset the clock then? <laughs> like, right, like it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, like the computer's... You like back then if you think about the computers like we're using right now compared to back then like oh yeah they're you know they're a lot smarter yeah pre pre iphone i didn't have my first iphone until what 2005 ish is that one i don't even know like it's it's been a hot minute 2006 whenever that was i was i had the blackberry for a long time because i feel like the iphone came out and then i my brother had gotten the iphone a little bit after it came out because it was just so cool that it had like the touch screen and everything mm -hmm. but I was just like nah because one of the things was for a Blackberry all the messages were encrypted and oh right 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 so I was just like oh like I was like eh. I guess I was always a little bit of a conspiracy theorist <laughs> I was like, state secrets on your Blackberry <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't want but I remember one time, because my mom, like, you know, just like any parent, I feel like growing up in that time, like, we knew more about the technology than she could. And I realized, like, from my mother's, like, because she was the main account, um, I could go in and I could read all my brother's text messages <laughs> from that oh, account, that like, funny. the way it was set up. But because <laughs> I had a BlackBerry, like, she couldn't read mine. Oh, so I was like, I'm not planning on getting in trouble, but just in case. <laughs> but in case I want to, got all the pieces in place. Yeah. 
you know i gotta cover all my bases especially because i'm a twin so like my brother oh. the time, he would rat me out any chance he got you know <laughs> like his competition <laughs> i'm gonna be the best kid now so i was just like man nah, i'm gonna keep these separate <laughs> but but eventually like the iphone just got too cool and like everyone had it so you couldn't you could barely communicate you know and you well and like now too head. like the way my business runs like information going from my phone to my computer like that being able to swap files back and forth i could not live without it like yeah i don't no have that because i have a windows computer and uh but i went to go get a new computer and i just it was like the mac i don't know macbook something or other they got rid of the usb plug yeah it's usb c now and i was like no and then i got apple they, that's they, what <laughs> that's what sold me on the windows because i was like i need a usb plug like everything i have is usb it's not right. USB-C. I was like, so okay. yeah now you have to buy like i, I my mac has the usb c and like so everything else i have is regular usb so i have like the dongle that connects them yeah but that's apple yeah <laughs> making a bunch of junk to put in a landfill yeah pretty much pretty much so annoying <laughs> so back to food so you were doing mainly drinks you mentioned you wanted to do garnishes um what kind of garnishes are we thinking well like i did candied cranberries over the holidays um i want to do some candied ginger I, one of the cocktails I had in Denmark actually had, and I will not attempt to make these because I know my limitations, um, had a macaroon on the side of it. And like, it was such a revelation because like, I love the idea of a snack <laughs> with my cocktail. <laughs> and I'm not a Bloody Mary drinker. I don't get like a whole freaking cheeseburger on a Bloody Mary if you want, but I've just never been a Bloody Mary drinker. But I love that idea of like a bite, you know, like with, with your drink because that combination of of textures and flavors like I really really love like one of the things I was doing over the holidays um again my my boys and I that we get together uh on Christmas we did the feast of the seven fishes which was so much fun and like you know we cooked and we drank and we did all kinds of things and at the end of the night I was like I want to play with sambuca I love sambuca like some people don't like the flavor of sambuca that heavy licorice but I love sambuca and i was like you know what else i love fire and i know that you can set sambuca on fire <laughs> so again yes, <you> <laughs> yes so we roasted marshmallows over sambuca um which is a thing that you can do so i'm that's going to be a video coming up the thing i learned though like it roasts so well that your stick will catch fire so metal skewers are <laughs> important yes does it make the marshmallow taste like anise or no it not really and the night we did it we were I I had gotten the little mini marshmallows because I, I didn't think this would be that successful it is successful though so I went and got big marshmallows I need to try it again because I wonder if because I had to like stop the burning because the, <laughs> the little marshmallows are so tiny like they were they were just like catch fire too quickly so um I need to try again with the larger marshmallows and I think maybe a little bit longer roasting time I'm interested to see if you get that that scent or that taste of anise from the uh from the licorice but i want to do i have to find another i know you can burn overproof liquors but i really want to come up with a s'more in a cocktail so a graham cracker rim a roasted marshmallow a chocolate component all in a cocktail um and i have a feeling i'm going to end up having to just make a chocolate liqueur to do it we'll see Hmm. I know, I know. I've been trying to set all kinds of things on fire. Like people should be very concerned. I've learned that um, scotch, some scotch will burn, but not all, even if it's, I forget what the ratio is, but depending on what proof something is, it'll burn supposedly like it's flammable, but it won't always catch on fire. <laughs> so well, one thing I remember is uh like growing up, it's very diverse in New Jersey. And one of the things that they, there was like this really good Brazilian steakhouse, Rodizio. Mm -hmm. Do you know what grappa is? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I used to cook sausages in like a little little thing over. Oh. Huh. So maybe grappa might be a interesting a alcohol. That's interesting because I bet I could flavor that without losing the alcohol content. And I'm also wondering if this, I mean, you said metal skewers, but if we're using a bigger marshmallow and we soak or use like a fresh, because, you know, like rosemary is super sturdy. Mm -hmm. like that might be a way to get that flavor in there without, you know, mm -hmm. needing it to be an alcohol part. So it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what else would, is that sturdy? Yeah. Eucalyptus? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> chocolate eucalyptus. That could be really good. Yeah. That could and be mint good. and chocolate to me is heavenly. So I bet mint and, or chocolate and eucalyptus. Mm, okay. All right. Now we're thinking. I like now it. We're thinking. Yeah. I feel like this is my favorite part of doing these interviews, but I wonder if it's boring to watch. <laughs> um, apologize <laughs> apologize but i just i like the uh you know one of the things i miss about the kitchen is like going back and forth with like recipes and like brainstorming brainstorming yeah you know that was i totally get that that's one of the things that like a lot of times i'll come up with like just like you and i are doing like oh i have this idea i want to try something with this flavor this flavor and this flavor and then like i'll bounce it off of my friends and be like hey like how does this sound to you like how you know or or like make it for them and have them try it and like that interaction that collaboration is so vital like it makes such a big difference and one of the things and that's one of the things with the youtube community i feel like everyone is so quick to try not to be mean or try not to you know it should be like overly nice almost mm -hmm. And I'm just decided I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty is a good policy. <laughs> yeah. uh, like sometimes I'll be watching like the Facebook, like the YouTube creator stuff. And they're like, what do you think about this one? And, you know, some people, I think it looks like you're, I thought you're sucking up, but you're kind of like trying too hard not to like get any bad karma. But I guess like, you know, sometimes you got to tell the truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> tell them before they post that. Like, it doesn't look great. Redo it. <laughs> yeah, try again. Try again. Yeah. But The thing I love about YouTube, though, is that, like, people just go and do and create. And I think that that's amazing. Like, the fact that, like, you have a, you have a platform, basically, to be as creative as you want, do it in any way. You don't have like a producer hanging over your shoulder or a client that needs something this way. I mean, obviously there are those things too, but like as a creator on YouTube, like to have carte blanche to do absolutely whatever uh, with is amazing. Like that, especially having been in like this industry for so long and like you're always producing for a client, you're always producing with like there's just I, I don't know like it's something and you're always thinking about like distribution like okay where's this going my very first job out of college I worked for a production company where they sold these basically corporate infomercials to different brands and companies a lot in the medical industry and they would as part of their sell would um, include airtime on various various television outlets which got very, very messy. And it was so interesting because like when you're distributing to these different outlets, there's all of these, like you're playing by so many different rules and their trends and their, like you're having to follow so many different things where with YouTube, you just, you can create. And there, there it is. And you create your own audience at the same time. It's amazing. However, I do <laughs> have a problem with you know, you're talking about distribution, they get like that airtime and stuff, which people definitely have more of a chance of being seen, you know, on YouTube than we have ever before, you know, when it came to, you, you don't have to get a publisher for a newspaper or a book yeah. to get you in there. But at the same time, they, 
it even if you look at like Donald Trump and stuff, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but the idea that they can just cancel anybody like that. Oh yeah, you're at the mercy of a, a private enterprise. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. And like for my, I mean, one of, I'm sure one of the many reasons <laughs> besides my mouth, um, <laughs> I don't, I don't really get recommended that much. And it's been kind of like brought to my attention by people that like subscribe to my channel. Like, Hey, like I was looking, like I had to actually like go and search you to like get you to come up, even though I'm subscribed and like click the bell, like all that stuff. Um, because I tend to curse a lot, number one. <laughs> um, I talk I talk about marijuana a lot because uh, that's oh interesting. Um, I wrote a book on edibles, and you know when I first started out, I was trying to promote that um, on like Instagram and Facebook because I was gonna try to like I was just trying to self publish because I was you know emailing publishers and all that other stuff, and nobody would touch it mm -hmm. because I wasn't like you know I wasn't a big name in cannabis or in like I wasn't um you know like there's a couple like rappers and stuff with like marijuana cookbooks out but they have mm -hmm. the they have the clout with the rap part you know or or you know the bad yeah there's a there's another thing bringing attention to them aside from that right so they just like, they wouldn't touch it. And then I tried to promote it on Facebook and YouTube. And they, I basically, you know, I didn't make any money with that because as soon as I started doing it, they like blocked me buying ads. They blocked me doing anything. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, well, it's all about drugs. And I'm like, you're selling drugs or whatever. And I'm like, no, I'm selling a book. A book is not drugs. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big difference. Yeah. These, are, these are not the same thing. Um, <laughs> And um, I had done a, a space cookie video for 420 um, in April. And because come on, 420, 20, you, ha you have to do it. So, um, and even in the video, I don't even say like, I don't say like, go out and, you know, go out young children and do all the drugs. I say, Come get into my unmarked van. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I say like, hey, like, you know, follow the rules where you are, you know, if you're yeah. in a, if you're of age and you can participate, do this. If not, like, don't, don't break the law is what I said. Right. And I also said, um, you can also do this with CBD, which is legal in all 50 states and federally legal. And um, they wound up flagging it. So now you can't see it unless you are above 18. And, and you have to be signed into YouTube and tell YouTube, hey, I'm above 18. So if you're one of those people who like doesn't want to answer the question or something right, like you're that, not gonna you're not going to see it. And I'm like, this is bullshit because I see all these cocktail fucking channels and yeah. I don't think you guys are getting flags for above 18, you know? No. And it's interesting. I've actually been curious about that as, you know, as someone that does have a channel about cocktails, like, and I, I've noticed with some other creators on Instagram, for example, they're, it's not consistent, but like, there's a good handful of them that say must be 21 to follow, or must be 18 plus to follow, which is interesting because a lot of, like a lot of the people that I pay attention to aren't even in the States. They're in other countries around the world and everybody has their own rules and regulations, right. As it relates to alcohol. Yeah. And so like, I've been very curious about how, like, like, you know, where do the YouTube gods decide, you know, like what's good and what's not like, for example, I have a friend who, um, has, has a channel about guns and gun history and information, but that much like cannabis is it falls under, like, there are all these different categories, right. That are heavily regulated. And if it falls under cannabis, if it falls under firearms, if it falls under all these different things, uh, there are rules about whether or not you can monetize. Um, there's rules about the specific content that's in the video. Like, it's very interesting. And I think that they throw a very broad brush at it at first to, like, make sure you don't have, like, some maniac saying, here, kid, take these drugs, or here's how you build a gun, you know, like, yeah. the things that are like, no, you shouldn't do a video about that, you know? Yeah. 
But at the same time, it catches people like you then who are putting something out that's like interesting content that isn't damaging, it isn't harmful, and yeah. it don't have the ability to share it in the way you'd like to. But as, as we're seeing in our first week of 2021, these are all private industries and they have the right to just flip the switch. So, and you know what, right now, okay. <laughs> like, okay, but cool. At the same time, I'm like, you know, then you, they can flip the switch, but they also like, how are they? They're also accountable for what's going on right now. Like, oh yeah. So yeah, that switch should have been flipped. For like, yeah. if you had enforced your policies all along, like it wouldn't be such a dramatic thing now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also like you. It just shows that you're picking and choosing too. So it's like there's plenty of marijuana companies mm -hmm. on Instagram and Facebook that I would see ads for them. Like House Plant is Seth Rogen's marijuana mm -hmm. company. How, how can I watch his ads about come buy my weed, but I can't have... That's interesting. Oh. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> so, but also like I don't, you know, and then they disabled my ability to buy ads and for a year and two months before, wow. before they got to my appeal. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the only, the only advice I can give is diversify. Uh, well, that, it was my ability to buy ads, period. So like when I started Chef Grace's place, um, I still couldn't buy ads. Oh, wow. I had been like, I personally had been blocked from buying ads. Wow. Which I was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. So I was just not but then all of a sudden when I started Chef Grace's place, that's when all of a sudden they saw the, you know, change. All of a sudden it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, these people, but censorship. Because <laughs> I just, I feel like we should have all these things, but we should have all these things that are like, you know, you don't, you don't get people not to want to do something by making it taboo. You know, right. I mean, we can look to prohibition for that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So the best thing is to legalize it and use education, you know, if you, yeah, for sure. If you drink it's like anything, everything in moderation, like if you learn about it, you can learn to appreciate it, then you don't abuse it. Yeah. I remember when, before I started cooking, like I was afraid of knives, you mm -hmm. know? Like they were scary. Like, you know, you could kill somebody with a knife. Yeah. But when I became a chef and learned more about knives, I was like, oh, you just, you know, keep it sharp. Don't point it at anybody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm literally speaking of knives. I, I have had the same set of Wusthof knives for 20 years. I love them. They're great. They were a really nice set when I got them at a very young age. <laughs> um, and they're dull. Oh my God. Like I could easier cut a steak with a spoon than I could with these knives right now. Like they're just, you know, after 20 years of use, I'm taking care of them. Like I always cut on wood boards and like they go in their block and like they don't but go do in the you dishwasher. Them every three to four months. No, I don't. That's again, <laughs> I could seriously cut a steak with a spoon easier than my chef's knife. So I'm literally, as soon as we're done here, taking them to be professionally sharpened <laughs> because they like they're beyond help. Like they they need a professional to take care of them. Well, I think um, for the first time, get the professional, but then yes. you have the sharpening stone and you know, well, I need to learn how to do it, right? Like I, yeah, because yeah, I have like the things that you drag. The knife through the which i think has made them worse yeah they make them worse don't do yeah that. definitely so i'm gonna throw those out i'm gonna get these sharpened but since it's been 20 years since i bought new knives i think i'm super excited i'm gonna buy a set of shoes oh. i want to go get my hands on them first and play with them and see if i like them but i'm, I'm really excited to get some uh, japanese pointy things i get to play with them at work um we have like a case of knives so if you go into like a sort of the tab you can 
that's where I was going to buy them from. Yeah, as well. yeah, they actually, I don't know if it's like all of them across the country, but they're having a sale on Miyabi, which is also a very good Japanese brand. Um, the only thing with the Japanese is that it, it's what, like for me, I actually prefer the Wostock because of the weight. It's heavier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so strange to me to have something that's, it's so like, it almost feels like fragile, but it, it's not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm going to break it, but I'm not going to break it. And, but it's so thin. And when you sharpen them though, it's a different, like, I think a Wusthof is at a 20 degree angle. Mm-hmm. And, and these are at like a 16, I think, or something. Yeah, like a 16. So yeah. you really got to be better at sharpening the Japanese stuff. But yeah, I'm going to leave that to professionals. Yeah. Like, I know my limitations. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, but actually, sur la table will sharpen your knives if you bring more than one. If they're like five dollars each, and then they, if you buy more than one, like if you bring more than one knife to get sharpened, mm-hmm. they sharpen one for free. So, really? Yeah. All right. Well, I've got six. <laughs> have to get sharpened. <laughs> but I you- mean, it's really bad. I noticed it um, when. I mean, I've noticed it forever. Like you should never have to saw at things, right? To like cut. But I um when I put one of my first cocktail videos up, a friend who I uh, used to work with and haven't talked to in a while sent me a message. She's like, hey, I love the videos. Do you need your knives sharpened? <laughs> and it's like, he's like, I noticed you sawing at that lemon. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's really bad. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's time. I gotta, it's, yeah, it's bad. You shouldn't ever have to go with a lemon. <laughs> like it's a piece of wood. But that said, serrated, Pairing knives don't get enough credit. Like the serrated knife is, it works great for tomatoes, great for like all that kind of stuff in a pinch. Like I have a, I got it for like five bucks at like an Ace Hardware store, not even at like a cooking place. They just had all these like Victory Knox uh, serrated pairing knives that are like this this long. And I should I should have just bought like the whole jar. Like they're in a jar by the register. Like oh my god. <laughs> Like I should have just bought the whole jar and had like them as my steak knives or something because <laughs> they're the best and they're serrated. Like I throw them in the dishwasher because it's cheap. I don't care. And then, um, but I just, I use that all. I probably use that, that and my chef knife the most. Yeah. But it's just so much easier to do stuff. Like even with like cutting a pineapple or something like something slippery like that. Like yeah. a long serrated bread knife is way better than trying to do it with your chef knife. So oh, that's a good idea with a pineapple. I've never thought about that. Hmm. Yeah, Cause that is a pain in the ass. Like taking that lid off and then cutting down the, the, side. the side of the pineapple. Ugh. It, it grips in there. That's why it's better. Huh. All right. I'll, I will try that next time. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that's another fun thing to set on fire. Pineapple. Oh, I love grilled pineapple. So yeah, setting that on fire. Ooh. I always uh, coat mine in cinnamon sugar first, and then I set it on fire. It's the best. This is just making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, the sandwich is like staring at me. <laughs> oh my god, go eat your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> that thing has morphed into something else now. Hopefully there's like olive oil and whatnot on there to like, it's marinated. <laughs> oh, it's definitely marinated. No other big job on that one. He went to the gym. He was like, I got it. He was so funny. I was like, babe, the interview starts in like nine minutes. Like, he's like, oh my God. He was like, can you ask her if we can move it like 20 minutes? Like, I got it. I got to make a sandwich. I got to make a sandwich. For- <laughs> You're just going to be in the background making a sandwich. <laughs> this is going to happen here. <laughs> I need food. I, I totally understand that. <laughs> I'm like it's okay you're in my other videos we know you exist like you can be there <laughs> well, but, and I really like your shelf of wine glasses and stuff oh yeah, yeah so I um part of that is because when I when I bought this house I lived so before this place I lived in a house that was a little bit bigger than this and I had all kinds of cabinet space and I have, again, a buying problem <laughs> where like, I really like, it's so funny when I was in college, so I'm going to digress a little bit. When I was in college, I actually worked at Crate and Barrel 
it was like my my job in college. I worked Those are at Crate and Barrel. Oh, I loved it. And then my paycheck went straight back to them and then some. Like, but it also, I got such an education in glassware, dishware, cookware, and knives. Like I, you know, a couple of years working at Crate and Barrel, you kind of pick that stuff up and the product reps would come and do like little classes. Um, so I've always like, I love my glassware. So then when I bought this place, it's smaller. It's just, I, I love my home. It's adorable, but it's also very, very old. I live in like a little historic district in Phoenix, which is not as romantic as it sounds because my neighbor loves meth. Um, but <laughs> it's huh. a very cute old house that does not have a lot of storage or cabinet space. So I was like, what am I going to do? I know floating shelves because I love to dust. So there's like floating <laughs> shelves all over the place. Do you really love to dust? Or you... No, I hate it. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I hate to dust. Like, absolutely hate it. And as I was putting these up, like, so many friends are like, you know, you're going to have to dust a lot. I'm like, no, no, no it's going to be fine. So, yeah, every time I get glasses down, I'm like, oh, wait, let me rinse them out first because of the dust. I feel like I always rinse them out anyway. So it's all right. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it's funny with, with Savage Kitchen, in buying, like, I over the past six months have bought so much booze that like it takes up real estate at this point and so I bought a, a bar cabinet because I used to have stuff on like just like a little shelf like you know I'd have like wine bottles and my like, couple bottles of booze and so then I, I bought like a serious I found this antique um deco cabinet that's like so beautiful found it on offer up like absolutely love this thing and now that is full <laughs> and also full of glassware and <laughs> like I'm going to end up needing to buy a new house to uh, <laughs> satisfy this habit that I have. It's really a problem. I have a, I zip tied a bunch of milk crates together and then I spray painted them. And that's our ball. It's <laughs> brilliant. I, I'm all about the DIY. Yeah. Cause uh, yeah, we had no, we didn't have like a bar area. Like this apartment is pretty small and the cabinets are very like, I, there's no cat there's no drawer in the kitchen that fits like a silverware thing oh geez yeah that's how small it is so I'm just like you know you gotta get creative but yep. I, I can't wait to buy a house with storage and all kitchen and those lovely French doors like <laughs> <laughs> yeah old, old houses old houses have had dies will come <laughs> Sounds like you need some gentrification over there. <laughs> oh man. I, yeah, this, I do like, I love this neighborhood. It's super cute. And like my house is like the little like Tudor style. So it looks like a little gingerbread house. It's adorable. And like all the houses in the neighborhood are different. And like people are generally like nice. Like I walk my dog at night and like neighbors say hello. Like it's nice. But this one neighbor <laughs> who lives immediate next, ne immediately next to me and refuses to wear shirts and loves meth. <sighs> Otherwise, it's great. <laughs> it's great. It's really awesome. Yeah. There's always there is one guy like that in the neighborhood, though. There's always one. Yeah. Friendly, friendly neighborhood method. You know. Yeah. He's nice. At yeah. least he's nice. <laughs> like it could yeah. be worse. It could be worse. But, <sighs> yeah. So I my neighborhood has lots of charm. <laughs> that's that's what we're gonna call it. Growing up, we had a uh, the next door neighbor's boyfriend. He, I mean, I was a kid, so I didn't understand like what kind of drugs he was on. But his, you know, he had, the teeth he had left didn't look so great. <laughs> and uh, I just remember he put the whole second story on the house that was next door to me. Like he was a carpenter and he did a great job, but he was like, it took him like five years to do it because he was like high the whole time. Oh, <laughs> God. I didn't realize until like maybe a year ago, my friend, I'm still like best friends with the girl who grew up down the block from me. Mm -hmm. and we were talking about growing up and everything. And this, we were talking about how awful it was because this guy used to, uh, they called him Dutch and we didn't. So we assumed he was from Holland and <laughs> we, but he's he like a safe assumption. Yeah, he used to whistle for the other neighborhood kid to come home like 
from okay. the second story he was working on. Like instead of like calling the house down the street, like he would he would whistle like one of like, those like Lassie come home. Like <laughs> one of those baseball park Lassie okay. whistles. And then I was like, ah, oh, this kid's gotta go home now. Like he can't play anymore. <laughs> but we would, you know, his real name. Uh, I guess I probably shouldn't say it on, you know, the internet, but uh, his, his nickname was Dutch and we thought he was from Holland and like a year, a year or so we were at my friend's wedding and we realized, wait a minute. <laughs> He's not from Holland? He's not from Holland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's Dutch, like, like a Dutch. Like, oh my God, it was such a like light bulb. That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah there's always one there's always someone like that always there's always one but you know it gives it gives you some good stories going on mm-hmm. but, yeah it was fun sometimes <laughs> all right i think i'm gonna go eat this sandwich <laughs> you should definitely go eat that sandwich <laughs> but come on again Maybe, uh, I mean, I'm talking to those guys on Monday, so. Oh, yeah, I uh, I can't wait to hear how that goes, I'm sure. Are you talking to both of them at the same time? There's three of them now. Oh, three, yeah, it's, uh, what, it's Vino, Rob, and Booze on the Rocks. I cannot remember his name, I am so sorry. I can, like, see his face and his channel is Booze on the Rocks. Dave, maybe? Dave, yeah, David, that's it. David, Two yeah. Canadians and... And a New Yorker. New Yorker. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I can't wait to find out. I'm like, is he Dominican? Is he like, he seems like he might be Dominican or Puerto Rican as well. Oh, yeah, maybe. But I just, whenever I talk to people from up north like that, like my accent comes out. Oh, I've heard it a couple of times. You said something (laughs) earlier and I was like, oh, there's the New Jersey. I hear it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Probably, it's probably going to be really bad. Oh, I love it. (laughs) I'm like that when I get around my, my parents and my, my aunts, especially, you know, we're all from Philly and like, I want it in particular just has like, Philly has its own like dialect for like, lack. I I lived in Philly for like, for, I went to the restaurant school at Walnut Hill College. So I lived there for like four years and they would say like water and like, water. Yeah. 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 Orsh water use orsh yeah uh-huh <laughs> i know <laughs> what and i'm like i'm only from like like i'm from new jersey like i'm not that far away like what's going on here yeah but there is a different it's so funny a few years ago we were all back because none of us live there anymore right like everybody's sort of scattered to the wind a lot of the families in florida um the carolinas new york arizona so anyway, we were all in Philly for, my cousin was getting married and we were like, and nobody lives close to each other. It's like, oh, well, let's go to Philly. We'll do like the bridal shower there. So we do, and we all get there and we go out to dinner the first night. Like everybody's arrived, like, oh, let's go. Let's go get something to eat. And we sit down in the restaurant and the waitress comes at this little Italian joint and, and she's like, what do you want to drink? And like all of us like what's that laughing because you just don't hear that anywhere else but in philly like that she could have been hugging us what do you want <laughs> like, it was, what do you want like it was it was it was like a hug it was like oh i want you to abuse me and give me italian food i'm so happy to be here <laughs> it's really good that's awesome oh my god so well so anyway say hi to those guys for me i'm super excited about their uh their challenge I think it's I think it's fun and you should definitely make a cocktail for that jump in on that I'm jumping in I'm excited too for I think they're gonna do a Valentine's Day one I think they're gonna do one like every month yeah I, it's which I think is a great idea and then because I feel like we'll be able to talk about the challenge that I like just passed and then we'll talk mm-hmm. about like you know upcoming challenge yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, the Christmas one was fun too. And people's, what people did for it were like all over the place, which I think is the fun of it, you know, like all kinds of different, I'm excited to see what the spicy, the spicy one is like. It's going to be good. But I do, I want to see some more shit talking though. There's not enough shit talking. <laughs> I'm like, you're from the Bronx. Like I'm going to fight with them. 
I, I think I, I will tune in and watch. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I got five bucks on the blonde. <laughs> it's a winner, but it's a challenge. Like we gotta have some sort of banter going on here, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I'll just open with, all right, so who's the best bartender? <laughs> right. Who sucks here? <laughs> yeah. Who's the winner? Two Canadians? What are we doing? What are we doing? I know that's, they're so nice. They're like, <laughs> they are so nice. That's why they're coming. Genuinely. <laughs> I wonder if they're nice or just the way they talk, they get offended for things that like don't mean anything to us. <laughs> oh, so oh, what, Canadians in general? Yeah, those guys. <laughs> probably those guys too but like you know I feel like those guys I mean I don't know any of them in person like only through our you know YouTube yeah. antics and yeah. other cocktail groups but what I know of them they're genuinely so nice like and just like chill like super chill but I think to be in the cocktail community that's like part of the fun right you're like whatever have a drink chill out yeah. like <laughs> Like you know you're drunk like, that's it. yeah you're upset yeah. have a cocktail it's gonna have be a fun. Cocktail. relax yeah spicy cocktail it's gonna be good well you know i think you're gonna win this competition i'm gonna tell them you're the first no winner i'm like no nope, she's she won savage kitchen she won savage, <laughs> savage kitchen won. well it's so funny that mr the very first thing i did was that mr black uh, comp I've never been in a cocktail competition in my life. I'm not a bartender. I don't know what I'm doing. So the first week of the Mr. Black competition, like Steve, the bartender announced it. And I was like, Ooh, I mean, like, I want to try this. I want to try this. And I was also like, I am not qualified to do this. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I was like, that's it. I'm going to come out swinging. And I won that week, this international competition. And I was shocked <laughs> like, or no? uh yeah there's um so what they did was they ran that competition for eight weeks and then each each week started like a new competition so and there was actually a tie one week so now there are nine winners um and our nine cocktails now like it just ended this week so now our nine cocktails go up against each other for a grand prize winner Ooh, yeah so so it'll how be interesting to see you? like how, how well no that work? part's done like the public that's how I won the first the first oh. week so that part's done so now it's a, a panel of judges so we'll see some of the other cocktails that won over these past eight weeks are amazing looking like so do I you to, like recreate it to taste it mm -hmm. yep yeah so for example like the week that I won what Steve the bartender did was took the top three cocktails of each week so that week was me and I forget what the other two were but they were all very different from each other and he recreated each one on his YouTube channel tasted them and then he selected the winner and so he did that for eight weeks in a row yeah and now those those nine because there was a tie one week so now those nine cocktails go to the panel of judges so fingers crossed my lavender latte will win we'll see <laughs> It might. Was it, it might. Was There's it some online. really interesting good cocktails. Uh, so lavender latte, that's alcoholic beverage, right? We're not talking. Mm -hmm. about so it's that Mr. Black coffee liqueur, which is freaking amazing. Um, and then cognac. Cognac, as I say, uh, Steve the barman likes to make fun of me for saying cognac instead of cognac. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, I love that guy. And then, uh, so yes, Mr. Black, cognac, and then lavender syrup and steamed milk. So it's warm. Ooh. It's delicious. Like, I'm not just saying that because it's my cocktail. It's legitimately delicious. That sounds delicious. Lavender is really underrated, I feel like. I agree. Yeah. And lavender syrup, like, in tea, like, you could do lavender syrup. You, you're a pastry chef, you know, like. I think lavender is delicious. Well, the, like the trio of like lavender, orange, and white chocolate, it was always like a favorite of mine. But I think another underrated like flower thing is the violet. It's violet. Ooh, yes, I love playing with, I have a bottle of creme de violet that I love. That stuff is great. Mm -hmm. but you you got to be careful with both yeah, of those. You can overdo it. Yeah, you can overdo it. That's probably why it's not so popular because people don't know how to 
you're not balanced enough you know <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah now i got more ideas <laughs> i love it spicy spicy yeah i can see your reels turning you're like "Ooh, what can i do from to violet <laughs> i was saying like maybe that vietnamese cinnamon and a floral Ooh, that could be good but I can't I can't go buy it like I can't go spend 20 plus dollars on a bottle of creme de violet that's the problem right now <laughs> I yeah I, I hear you my bank account hears you <laughs> yeah. I, got, I was like oh, you save so much money during quarantine because you're not out drinking well yeah you should see my cabinet <laughs> exactly and then you just have all these things it's kind of like I feel like you're making potions you know like this. that's what it feels like I feel very mad scientist in my kitchen yeah. but it's especially when I have the blowtorch out, I'm like, Shh, you know, like burning spices and like, I have beakers literally like, yeah, it feels very bad scientist, but it's fun. Now, now I'm thinking, oh man, I want to buy a beaker. <laughs> I'll do it, guys. <laughs> get monetized first. That's right. That's right. Get, get monetized. Yeah. Like I made my first $11 on Amazon. I was like, Savage Kitchen's profitable. And I've spent like 300 bucks at Total Wine that week. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> I've gotten kicked out of the Amazon program twice already for like not having enough subscribers or something. Oh, so I don't know if I should, I don't, but I don't really know what the limit is. Like what the baseline is. I'm not, I'm not sure like there, I just this last week actually was going back and forth with their customer service, which is like a joke, um, trying to get questions answered that I still don't have answers to. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll try again. But the problem is every time I do it, you, it changes the hyphen or whatever. Like it starts. Yes, you have to, I, I went through that this week, had to update every single link. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. well, I don't really want to do that again until I know it don't I'm like not gonna have to change it again you know yeah because I want to keep the chef grace's place stuff and it's like like can't if you get they make you like restart it as if that account is still in existence and like you you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I'm like why can't I just reapply with the same thing <laughs> Ugh. very annoying I know one day <laughs> That's the thing. It's all, it's all going to come at once. That's, that's the hard part about it is because you really, I mean, it's a huge time investment, but when you don't have any money, it makes an even longer time investment, you know? Yes. Yeah. And it's one of those things too, that like, there are not immediate results, you know, like it's, it's very much like a, just keep plugging away at it. It's compound interest, right? Like you just put a little bit in and then put a little bit more. And meanwhile, you're building, but it just feels like such baby steps. I get it. Or sometimes, a lot of times, I just feel like it's not even it's just like a flat line. <laughs> no, don't keep keep at it. Just don't look at your metrics for a while. I have a friend who who says that to me all the time. My friend with her uh, production company, she's like, just don't look at your metrics for a while and just just keep doing it. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> at this point, I want it so bad just because I want to be able to be my own boss and have like that freedom yeah I can't not look at it <laughs> <laughs> well keep doing the things like keep doing what you're doing I keep do I do all the things yeah I just I'm like come on and then and then I see like these twins who like never heard oh I love them twins the new trend <laughs> yes I I I like I love and I hate them at the same time. <laughs> yes, because they were overnight sensations. Yeah, and I'm also like, how did you not hear that song before? How, do, like, how are you not lying to me? Like, yeah, well, you've heard their story, right? How they they grew up in a super religious home, and they just like they were only allowed to listen to church music. My my boyfriend grew up in a pretty religious home. <laughs> and, uh, he still went to public school. You know what I mean? Like maybe they went to maybe they went to like Christian school or something. So maybe that. But maybe. I I love them though. Those guys, uh, I feel like I found them the same time everybody else did. 
you know, and like, I well, watch them regularly. And like, how, how is that possible? You know what I mean? It's distribution. You had to be in front of those eyeballs in order for them to see it, you know? Well, and I think they, they caught lightning in a bottle with, uh, you know, their posts going viral on other platforms. Yeah. Um, that, I think that's the thing that they had already been, they had already been slogging at this. So they had a backlog of content and then they had this moment, right. Where something went viral on other platforms. So then like, yeah. Here, like here I am like the the perfect example of the user like I saw somebody posted on Facebook a link to them listening to Jolene and then I fell down the rabbit hole and watched like 30 videos of them like and I'm addicted like every time like I have they're one of I think two channels where I have the notification bell turned on because like I want to see what they're like they did Foo Fighters the other day I love Foo Fighters you know like and it's just one of those I don't know they just I like so that the one I've seen a couple of them now, but the one the Alicia Keys one that they're showing that's another question I did have though. Like they're showing the uh, music video to it, which is they nice. they had issues um, with some with copyright. Yeah, because I'm like, how are these are super famous songs? Like, how are you allowed to play them? And you know, but yeah, but I kind of feel like I hate that. Like. That you're not you know what I mean you're not trying to pretend like you wrote that song I feel like yeah like there's the context is important like they're clearly yeah. not like infringing upon somebody's copyright they're creating new content based on somebody else's yeah and I creation. also feel like the people like the even though they're very famous like the musicians that they're doing they're kind of like advertising for them like you're yeah, like up. all of a sudden Phil Collins was on the top 10 charts again with yeah. Indie Dirt Night, you know, like that guy should be writing them a huge thank you note. And I'm sure he was, you know, like that's like how is, you know, there's so many young kids that think like Miley Cyrus wrote Jolene. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wild. But those guys were smart because they, when they, and I'm, I'm speculating a little bit, but in following their journey a bit, they did start getting into trouble when they got more attention with copyright infringement, like certain studios not being okay with it. And then they went and started a Patreon account, uh, which was very, very smart. So now they have exclusive content on their Patreon that people pay membership. And so they have revenue coming to them from Patreon and from uh, YouTube and from their merch. So they've got three streams of income going. Yeah, that's, that's all in the that's all in the playbook you know what i'm saying just gotta get that uh that's the thing you gotta like unlock all that shit which is kind of kind of annoying <laughs> you know if i got like less than a thousand subscribers like help me out let me sell a t-shirt you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> you know one day <laughs> we'll get there one day just keep at it <laughs> how long have you been doing your channel since since like the beginning of March. So, okay, so. not long at all. And you're already at what, five something, 500 some subscribers? 476. Okay. We're getting there. That That's not bad at all. Not bad, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Just keep at it. Keep going. But we'll get there. It'll be fun. It is fun right now. Like, I, cause I just, you know, it's like, do I want to go work for a corporation? Like, Sir Latav is great. Like, there's nothing like wrong with that. It's just, uh, especially in cooking you get, and I'm sure photography, you get to a point where like, you don't want to be doing everybody else's recipes, you know? Yes. So I'm going to get there. But every time I go into work, I'm like, could be making this my own recipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I mean, sometimes I do anyway, but. <laughs> well, and like you said before, like every time you're in front of a class, those are new eyeballs that you can, that you can yeah. direct to you. Which is nice. Anyway. All right. I'm gonna <laughs> <get my> sandwich. <laughs> Go eat your sandwich. <laughs> Go eat your sandwich. Um, okay. So, uh. Thanks for hanging out and listening. Yeah. Yammer on about, I want to be monetized. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But, I, I'm, uh, I'm with you. Yeah. But definitely come on again. 
Yeah. I would love to. Yeah. Let's come on and talk some shit about those uh, for the Valentine's Day cocktail. Oh, I'm all over it. Yeah. Let's uh huh. That would be fun. <laughs> all right. I'm in. I'm so in. I love it. <laughs> We could do maybe we could do our own like review or something of like their cocktails. And, pick a winner. <laughs> pick a winner. and I'm thinking for Valentine's Day, I'm already. Oh, I already know what I'm gonna do. Okay. Wait. Yeah. It's gonna be dark. <laughs> so, like broken heart dark or like <laughs> well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> table for one i yes it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be dark <laughs> it seems appropriate for valentine's day it's perfect especially in yeah quarantine valentine's day <sighs> honestly yeah okay well on that note <laughs> see you later <laughs> bye